Hello everybody, welcome back to Fanblade. Well, this is exciting. Uh, I wasn't expecting to have any time off work, but my boss came to me and said, you've got too much annual leave owing, take a holiday. Uh, so here I am. <laughs> I wasn't planning to build anything. I don't normally plan to build things uh, this close to when we're coming into winter because it gets ridiculously cold in here. But I've got 10 days off and while the temperature is still in double figures, I've got to make something. So the obvious question is, what am I going to make? <laughs> and I put that question to uh, you, my loyal viewers, to find out what you wanted to see. And, uh, yes, I've just checked the results. They're out of, I think it was 133 votes, 38% wanted to see a multi-scale five-string bass. Cool. Let's do that. Um, I should say as well that uh, a very close second, 31% wanted to see the eight-string bass. I really want to do one of those, so I'm probably going to be planning for those when I come back after winter, but, uh, yes wait a wee while but you know that'll be coming but in the meantime i have to get cracking because the clock is ticking and uh i've got to design this thing from scratch because i don't have any templates i don't have any patterns <laughs> i don't know what the dimensions of this thing are going to be i've got to lay out some paper draw the whole thing we're going to figure this thing out as i go neck that's the edges of the neck and these are of course five strings you will note that i have drawn the nut and the bridge in perfectly square this is because i needed to measure out the string spacing and the spacing of the strings this way still has to be uh, even relative to the center line so the center line is still vitally important in this process uh, even if the scale length is going all over the place and nothing is going to be square to it, well, except for one fret, but I'll talk about that very shortly. Now, I have decided on a scale length of 890 for the B string and 820 for the G string. The centre, the, 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 the difference between those is 855, and that's what I've measured for the A string there. That's going to be right up the centre. So wherever, wherever these angles wind up being they're always going to be moving through that point there uh, so I know that I've always got everything lined up. As far as working out what these angles are going to be here, well, there's a little bit to this. This does get a lot more complicated than simply measuring your fret positions and marking them. I know that the center line is going to be 855, so I can work out my fret position measurements from that. Then, <laughs> when I know where the 24th fret is, then I can measure another centimetre or so, it doesn't really matter. So I know where the end of the neck is. Then when I know how long the fingerboard is, find the centre of the fingerboard, and that's where I'm going to put what they call the vertical fret. Uh, that is the fret that is perfectly square to the centre line. Now, <laughs> the, that is movable. Um, if you were to have the vertical fret at the 12th fret, then that's fine, the vertical fret would be in the center of the scale line, everything would come together nicely in the middle, but it doesn't have to. You can shift that so that it looks nicer having the vertical fret in the middle of the fingerboard. What all that does is that pushes the bridge out a little bit further. In, in an extreme example, if I were to have the, uh, br the, the nut be perfectly square, then as these scale lengths fan out, you wind up with the bridge being on a really, really weird angle. And the, the exact opposite can happen. If I put the bridge square, that would push the nut out on an extreme direction out there. I feel like the best way to illustrate this principle is with toothpicks and plywood. Um, I've just quickly made this little sort of illustrative jig. You can shift the measurements relative to each other 
and all the angles change, but the relationship between frets, the measurement between each fret, remains exactly the same, uh, regardless of what angle they're on or where they are in relation to each other. So that's basically what we're doing. We're deciding which one of these is going to be the one that's perfectly, uh, perfectly square, and then we're taking our measurements uh, from that point. Everything is movable. <laughs> <laughs> we can decide where we want to put things, and I want to put it in the middle of the neck, which I have to measure first. So I've got to get my scale measurements for the center, work out all that. Then I have to get my scale measurements for the B string and work out which one of those is going to be closest to that mark. And then that's my starting point for measuring all the way back to wherever this winds up and wherever this winds up. And then it's the same with the G string as well. Uh, and that's going to give me all of my angles and all of my positions with one vertical fret right in the center of the fingerboard. I also need to tell you, <laughs> as if that's not enough information for you, I'm not measuring to the edge of the fingerboard. I'm measuring along the string. Geometrically, this is kind of a little bit more accurate because if I were to be measuring from this point instead of that point, then you get parallax error whereby that's going to be about, you know, a millimeter or so too far that way. The scale calculations are based on the position along the string. That string needs to be stopped in order to play the note you want. We're going to measure them along the strings, which never normally happens because you're measuring along the center line and then everything's square and it all adds up anyway and then uh, it's all just so much easier. This is not. As I was marking all of these out, it occurred to me that I'm actually going to have to mark all of this out again on the fingerboard. I probably didn't need to do this on the paper, but it is good practice. Measure twice, cut once, going to design a bit of a body, going to figure out what wood I've got that I can make this out of. I was kind of planning on using my standard uh, shape that I quite like and that I've made several of. Um, in fact, I actually have some blanks cut out in this shape already. But I don't know if it really suits the sort of the weird angular thing. Something perhaps that matches the bridge on that angle. I don't know. Let's play with shapes. Okay, I've been playing with this for a while now, and I think I've got it to a point where I like it. Everything's sort of nicely balanced, sort of aesthetically, the curves look, you know, they, they, they are nice. Um, it fits my design style as well with the, uh, uh, the neck cutaway, just coming in a straight line directly past there. There's no thing that sticks out and gets in the way, it's just a straight line behind the neck. Um, there's plenty of space for you to put your, your hand, it's small, it'll be lightweight. It matches my, my standard headstock shape, um, which I'm actually going to have to modify because I suspect that it might look better instead of having the A string tuner sticking out this side, if I drill this hole a little bit over here and have it coming out this side as well, just because of the way the everything sort of slants that way. It gets a bit long if this one's sticking out all the way out there. Uh, yes, so I'm kind of happy with that. Also, 
Uh, the other thing that I had to be mindful of is that what I'm building it out of isn't that wide. I've got a maximum of 300 millimeters width to play with, and I believe I am pretty much sitting right on 300, so yeah, this is going to be good. Neck's going to be quiller, fingerboard's going to be quiller, I'm going to ebonize it because I know how to do that now, and I'm even going to ebonize some inlays in there. They won't be inlays, they'll just be patterns that I'll mask off. Uh, yeah, I'm getting excited. <laughs> this is going to be a good one. The body is going to be made out of a giant slab of walnut. Um, this is, as I say, 300 mil wide. It needs a bit of cleaning up and a little bit of work. For the top, I am going to use this piece of, I believe, I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> if I'm completely honest, I think it's some sort of redwood. Um, but uh, uh, this will, if I get two pieces of this side by side, maybe take a slice out of the centre so we can maximise this interesting grain. Get a couple of strips of that running up uh, either side of the top. I think I will make a template uh, from this pattern simply because I quite like it. <laughs> uh, if I play this thing and decide it's comfortable, I may want to make more, so I'll quickly make a template. Um, and apart from that, yeah, I think I'm ready to actually start doing woodwork. One template made out of acrylic. This was actually a suggestion from a viewer and I couldn't find the original comment so I, I can't actually give credit to the person who suggested this but you know who you are, thank you. Um, and what an acrylic template lets you do is move it around to maximise your visual appeal. So that's that. Uh. <sighs> Those clamps weigh a ton. Uh, right, block of quiller. This is a neck blank, or to be more accurate, it is about six neck blanks. This is the same block that I made the uh, the two bases at the start of the year. Made the necks from this block. It is beautifully quarter sawn. Um, the grain's just going straight down there. Uh, so if I measure, I think it's 75, and then uh, uh, I can split that into two blanks to try and make the most of this timber. And after that, I think I'll do the scarf join, then I can let that glue just set overnight with the other stuff. Um, 
Uh, and I can go back into the warm in the house and uh, think about a custom-made bridge and a custom-made pickup. Because they're both going to have to be custom-made. <laughs> yeah, that's probably going to take quite a bit of time. I might have to do up a little bit of a schedule to work out uh, how I'm going to pull this off in 10 days. But, for now, cut a block, split a block, scarf a block, neck black. It is the next day. It is time for the declampification of this thing. I've made a little bit of a schedule and I think I've got everything pretty well planned out. I do have time to do binding. I do have time to do all of the custom hardware. It is going to work. It is going to be fine. Today I'm going to spend more time working on the body, get this pretty much carved, bound. Uh, not going to cut any cavities just yet, but I just want to have this thing more or less done. So I can just put that aside and uh, spend a lot of time working on the neck, because the neck is going to take quite a lot of work on this one. So yeah, that's where we're at. Declamping, cutting, carving, binding channels, that sort of stuff. That's come up an absolute treat. <laughs> uh, I'm really happy with how we are going. This is this is going to be a good one. I haven't finished sanding at the back yet. There's some awfully rough uh, saw marks in there that I hadn't quite realised. That's that one particularly is quite deep. But the top, the top. 
<laughs> I'm mightily impressed with this wood. I really do need to go and find out what it is. As the grain of the wood is sort of coming in that way, and as I carved in there, that was the place I started, and this bit here revealed itself to me, and I thought, holy moly, this thing's going to look incredible if it does that all the way over, but then it sort of didn't. Now, binding. Normally I would be using cream binding because that's all I've sort of had up until now, but I have a project coming up and I needed some black binding. Uh, this also has the advantage of being a bit thicker, or a little bit wider, uh, so that uh, just the thickness of this top, I mean that is quite an extreme angle to go on if your binding channel is only that tall. Uh, you can wind up sanding most of it away, but I've got plenty of uh, plenty of plastic there to deal with. Uh, yes, should look good. Should be rather spectacular. Going to install this, uh, and then yes, what am I going to do after that? I'll have to go and consult the schedule. But uh, yes, it's binding time. So there we go, from nothing to that in the space of one video. <laughs> uh, I'm making progress, I'm going to try and make quick work of this thing. Um, in the next video we'll be looking at the neck and uh, doing all kinds of crazy things with, with frets and headstock angles, because I'm not entirely certain how I'm going to do the headstock to fingerboard transition uh, on that angle. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to gonna have to have a serious think about that. I don't sort of geometrically it's very very strange and I don't really know what to do with it until I'm looking at it so uh, we'll, we'll we'll learn as we go on that one but uh, for now uh, I just want to say thank you very much for watching thank you very much for subscribing uh, and I will see you in a couple of days. Thank you. <laughs>